I've been in ministry for a long time, and I, I have heard uh, this one statement more than once, and I probably should um, just kind of say it up front because it may be a statement that you're thinking about uh, as we go through the sermon today. I remember a number of times after a sermon, someone was trying to tell me uh, how they were trying to be affirming. They say, Pastor, that's a really great word. Hey, preachers love to hear that what they've spoken was a word from the Lord. Um, and we always like to believe that, that that affirmation is not just, hey, you're a good public speaker. Because not all of us are. Um, but all of us who are willing to get in front of you with the word of God in our hand, we are committed to, to one thing, and that's getting the word of God that was given to his followers long before we existed into us too, so that what existed on our behalf, we can then keep going for the sake of those we've yet to meet generations from now. But it's really interesting because sometimes we get to the end of a, of a sermon and someone will come and say, Pastor, that was a really good word. Hey, thank you so much for that. I know there were a lot of people in this room that needed to hear that. And I'm, I'm always tempted to ask, are you one of them? Um, chapter 24 of Acts, is it's a, a hard word. And... Um, I want to just answer the question on the front end that the word is likely for others in the room, but there's a pretty decent chance that it's for you too. Um, I thought about summing up this whole sermon in this, with the statement, uh, convenient conviction. Conviction's really good when it's directed at someone else. But conviction towards us? Not always so wonderful. But this is what we get in chapter 24. We get some, some stuff on the front end where we get to join in a crowd pointing fingers at someone else and all that they've done wrong and how they're ruining the world. And, but then the chapter ends up with us and fingers seemingly being pointed right back at us. So I want to uh, invite you to, to keep listening, even when listening leads you to, I'm sure he's not talking about me here. I want to invite you uh, to just consider that before you deflect the word of God, that you would hold it a little longer, consider it. And the reminder that what I'm asking you to do, I've had to do all week long. You know, I get to sit in the chair of the judge and the jury sometimes. Um, but I've, I've had to sit as the one on trial all week long. Now, how do we get here? If you were here last week, you may recall or not. If you weren't here last week, I'd invite you to go back. We've always got our sermons on podcasts, YouTube, the website and such. Uh, chapter 23, we're working through the book of Acts one chapter at a time, and now that we're in 24, we're like only a month away from finishing this long journey through the book of Acts. And then we're going to bump into the book of Exodus, which is an even longer book, but we're not going to do it a chapter a week because it might make us uh, go well beyond the amount of time you'd like me to be your pastor. So we're just going to, we're going to summar, summarize it a bit over the course of some weeks, but we're almost to the end of Acts, but here's how we got to where we are today. Paul, last chapter, was in front of the Sanhedrin. Remember the Sanhedrin, 71 people, high priest, 70 others, made up of Sadducees and Pharisees, who, by the way, hated each other more than any, either of them hated Paul. So Paul is on trial in front of them. He calls out that he's a Pharisee. The Pharisees are like, oh, he's one of us. Wait, he's one of us. The Sadducees are like, yeah, he's one of y'all. And it starts. And the thing gets going. Then the nephew of Paul, we didn't even realize he had a sister until now, but he has a sister who has a son, and the son was overhearing these 40 guys who had an idea. We don't like Paul, all of us, so we're not going to eat or drink until that Paul guy's dead. Let's just make a pact with each other. Well, that word got to the nephew. The nephew takes it to Paul. Paul says, take it to the people who can do something about this. You see, I'm in jail. So the nephew makes it ultimately to the commander. The commander's like, this is not going to happen on my watch. I'm not going to let this happen to Paul. I mean, I don't even know if he's done anything wrong legally. It's you religious people who are upset with him. So I'm going to send him off. And he says, I'm going to send him off to, to Caesarea and to Governor Felix. And this is where chapter 24 begins. Chapter 24, verse 1. Five days later, 
after Paul had been sent away, the high priest Ananias went down to Caesarea with some of the elders and a lawyer named Tertullus. Man, they got their lawyer pretty quick, like five days, and he already knows the whole case. Well, they brought their charges against Paul before the governor. And when Paul was called in, Tertullus presented his case before Felix. We have enjoyed a long period of peace under you, and your foresight has brought about reforms in this nation. Everywhere and in every way, most excellent Felix, we acknowledge this with profound gratitude. Oh, come on, man. Wipe that nose clean. But in order not to weary you further, Your Honor, I would request that you be kind enough to hear us briefly. We have found this man, they're talking about Paul, to be a troublemaker, stirring up riots among the Jews all over the world. He's a ringleader of the Nazarene sect and even tried to desecrate the temple, so we seized him. By examining him yourself, you will be able to learn the truth about all these charges we are bringing against him. The other Jews joined in the accusation, asserting that these things were true. So these Jews had gathered a lawyer pretty quickly, Tertullus, and the elders and some Jews, and the, they're all five days later in the presence of this man Paul at the court. Remember, they had to walk a ways to get there. They try their very best to validate their charges. Brown nosing the, the governor a little bit, you might say, but then laying out their case. And then you have these like, who was that guy in the movie, Yaya or whatever his name was? Yeah, yeah, get him, boys, get him. I mean, those other Jews were doing that kind of stuff. I'm sorry, I find it a bit comical. But this is how Paul replies. He says, when the governor motioned for him to speak, Paul replied, I know that for a number of years you have been a judge over this nation, so I gladly make my defense. You can easily verify that no more than 12 days ago I went up to Jerusalem to worship. My accusers did not find me arguing with anyone at the temple or stirring up a crowd in the synagogues or anywhere else in the city. And they cannot prove to you the charges they are now making against me. However, I admit I worship the God of our ancestors as a follower of the way, which they call a sect. I believe everything that's in accordance with the law and that's written in the prophets. And I have the same hope in God as these men themselves have, that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. So I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and before men. After an absence of several years, I came to Jerusalem to bring my people gifts for the poor and to present offerings. I was ceremonially clean when they found me in the temple courts doing this. There was no crowd with me, nor was I involved in any disturbance. But there are some Jews from the province of Asia who ought to be here before you and bring charges if they have anything against me. Or these who are here should state what crime they found in me when I stood before the Sanhedrin. Unless it was this one thing I shouted as I stood there, it is concerning the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you. Now, I've heard it said from lawyers that you do not, generally speaking, want to try to defend yourself. Usually doesn't go well. But Paul, he's only got himself in most of these cases to offer his own defense. And it seems to me that the turtleist, the, the case that's being made against Paul, is completely made up. Maybe not completely, but it sure seems like a lot of the details that that been laid out, Paul says, look, point by point, I can prove to you that what he just said is a bold-faced lie. This is not true. And Felix, I know you weren't there, but we can go back to the Sanhedrin and we can ask them. We can ask for some credible witnesses to, to tell you what they saw, but basically everything being said against me is not true. Now, what I did find kind of interesting was in verse 19, I think he's alluding back to chapter 19. If you were here, you may remember. He says here in this moment, well, okay, so these Jerusalem Jews, they have nothing to go on. There may have been a little altercation there in Asia. Ephesus, you remember? The goddess Artemis? Remember this conversation where, where Paul shows up and, and there's, this, um, there's these demons that are trying to be cast out? Remember this? Do you remember any of these details? Artemis is like the trade of the town, and now Paul's getting in the way of all of this, saying that Jesus has more power than the... Go back, 19. 
Go back and reread chapter 19. He's saying they may have a problem. There was a riot in that town, but I've not caused any riots in Jerusalem. Now, it was halfway through this chapter when I started asking myself. Now, granted, this Acts is written by Luke. Luke has more of a reason to defend Paul than Luke has a reason to defend those who are against Paul. Fairness. But what's true? What really happened in Jerusalem? I mean, should we believe that because there are a lot more voices saying this thing happened than Paul and maybe a few others who would say it didn't, that we should go along with the crowd? Does more witness mean more truth? Does more volume mean more truth? This, this is where I keep getting hung up because I, and maybe you, or someone else in this room who needs to hear this, walk around in a world that's becoming more and more AI generated. Just a collection of who we are being put right back in front of us as truth. Some of us allow our social media streams to be our news source and declare that anything I read there must be true, forgetting that what we read there has been fixed by an algorithm so that you'll never see anything other than what you wanted to see in the first place. You may not realize this. There's a reason why all of your news sources seem to agree with each other. Or because we've committed our loyalty to a particular news source, pretending that our news source is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help them God, and the other one's just a bunch of bold-faced lies, depending on which news source you watch, you believe that of the other. You're both wrong, and you're both right. <laughs> Because regardless of your news source, there's money to be made by the news. <laughs> and neither of them are correct all the time. And neither of them are telling the truth all of the time. And both of them are trying to unnerve those who are in favor of the other one. But we are buying in. We've bought in to the echo chambers all around us. And that's why we've made it so easy to, to say, I'm on this team and you're on that team. And since you're not on this team, you must be evil. Come on, people. Come on, people. I mean, I just look at it this way. If I took even a percentage of the minutes spent scrolling or watching, and just tithed the time I spend collecting news by giving 10% of my news collecting to the Lord and to truth, to God's word, to the person Jesus that I've committed to follow and to become more like, the one who called himself the truth. I mean, come on. In the book of James, we have Jesus' stepbrother, or half-brother. He says, and I think he probably overheard Jesus saying this too. He says, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Just this past week, I'm feeling within myself as I read my online sources. And I'm feeling kind of on behalf of you as I watch some of you say out loud things. So if you watched last week's news or scroll through your social media of last week, you should not watch the Olympics for the rest of the Olympics. You should not watch them. You should be so offended by what happened in the opening ceremony that you should completely discredit the years of effort and energy that has gone into preparing for those Olympics by athletes who had absolutely nothing to do with opening ceremonies. We should not watch even the diver from the woodlands compete and win a silver medal. I was watching it, by the way. 
Because I personally do not think the opening ceremonies director, creator, and all those who were complicit or implicit in the development of that whole thing, A, I'm not counting on them to be my Christian witness. I'm not asking for them to defend the faith. And I recognize that there's a big difference between them and the ones who are participating in the actual events. And I'm deciding that the hard work and dedication of athletes is much more valuable and worth paying attention to than this creative type. We're gonna turn on our TVs this week and the weeks to follow between now and November. We're gonna give ourselves every reason to believe that we are right and they are wrong. To pick who you are and who they are. The, the world has completely distracted us. Distracted me, distracted you, distracted us. They've got us chasing after stuff that is not of the Lord. It's not from his word. They've, they've led us to believe that someone can do for us better than the Lord can do for us. Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. Angry at the left, angry at the right, angry. It's all the distraction. The evil one has got us all distracted. I don't mean to step or stomp. But I've been called to sit in this chair to deliver the truth of God. And the truth of God, keeping it safe in the first century versus the truth of God as it relates to us today is not the type of truth that will be much help to us. So what do we do? How do we, how do we respond to a culture like this? How do we keep ourselves from getting sucked in to, to acting just as they act, doing the things that they do? I've discovered that for me, at least, this may not be helpful for you, but for me, what's helpful is every, every time that I find myself trying to lump a group of people together for the purposes of demonizing them or simply to make it safer to understand them. I try to immediately, I try. I don't always accomplish this. I try to think of somebody that I know and love who someone else would put in that same bucket, bucket of people and remind myself that not all of them are the same. Not all men, all men are not the same. Not all women, all women are not the same. All teenagers, not the same. All old people, not the same. All Democrats, Republicans, gay, straight, they're not all the same. They're all individually created by the God who individually created you. There may be one way out. I can tell I've made a lot of friends this morning. Let me try to redeem this. If you're still listening, this is why I've been hit by this this week. It's the second half. Verse 22, then Felix, who was well acquainted with the way, adjourned the proceedings. And when Lysias, the commander, comes, he said, I will decide your case. And so he ordered the centurion to keep Paul under guard, but to give him some freedom and permit his friends to take care of his needs. Several days later, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish. He sent for Paul and listened to him as he spoke about faith in Christ Jesus. As Paul talked about righteousness and self-control and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and said, that's enough for now. You may leave. When I find it convenient, I'll send for you. I was just imagining myself in that place 
Paul speaking, teaching on the goodness of Christ Jesus. The salvation that he had found when he met Jesus on the road. Leans in on Drusilla. Hey, Drusilla, the Messiah that we've been waiting for. We, collectively, Drusilla, you, me, we've been waiting for. I met him on the road. And the man I met on the road was full of grace and full of forgiveness, full of truth. So much so that I've been following him around town to town, defending him and, and what he's done for us and what he plans to do when the whole thing comes to a close. Drusilla, listen. Jesus is calling us to righteousness. He's calling us to self-control. Jesus tells us how the whole thing will end. In the midst of hearing about things like righteousness, which could also be justice, or self-control, or, or the ultimate end of things, Felix, who is overhearing, okay, that's enough. That's enough of that talk. I'll come back when it's more convenient. So what do we think Paul said? We're not real sure. But I know that we have some writings, some letters of things that he said to churches. And I suspect that he didn't constantly change what he was saying. So in, in Romans chapter three, uh, there's this really important statement that he makes. He says that law is not what makes you righteous. Following the rules, following the law is not what makes you righteous. In fact, he goes to say, as it's written in the scriptures, there's no one righteous, not even one. No one who understands and no one who seeks God. All have turned away. But then he picks up in the second half of that chapter and he says, but, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. For all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace. So it seems like Paul is saying, Drusilla, and to all of you who gather at the church at Wood Forest, regardless of what brought you into the room, regardless of the sin that befell you in your childhood or just last week, you can be forgiven. You can be wiped clean. You can be made the righteousness of God, not because of what you've done, if you just grovel enough, but because of what he has done in sending his son. He wanted nothing to separate you from his love. He wanted you to have him live inside of you so that you could represent him in the world. And all you have to do is open your heart to him. Receive him. Let him do the work in you instead of trying harder to do the work yourself. I think this is one of the things Paul said, and, and to me it sounds like good news because I know myself, how prone I am to, to wander, to go my own way, to meet my own needs, to hang with people like me. I just know how this is who I am. Thanks be to God, it's by his grace that I'm made righteous. When he talks about self-control, I, I thought about Galatians 5. You may remember the fruit of the Spirit. Peace, patience, kindness, goodness. Self-control is on that list which is great news for me because I don't have a lot of self-control sometimes. I was playing golf this past week. I had very little self-control. <laughs> and I've played golf with some of you. You have a little bit more than me. But to be reminded that's a fruit of the Spirit at work in me, that I can't will myself to being more self-controlled, I have to ask the Lord for more of it, more of his Spirit to live in me. And then the third, when he talks about the final judgment, I'm not sure why Felix got nervous about that because here's what Paul said to the church in Ephesus. He said, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world. And when you were following the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who's now at work in those who are disobedient. He said, all of us also lived among them at one time, glorifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. And like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But, sometimes the but's really important. Don't stop reading. But, because of his great love for us, his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy, he made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It's by faith that you're saved. 
And God raises us up with Christ, seated us with him in the heavenly realms with Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you've been saved, through faith. This is not from yourselves, it's a gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. I come to the end of a a sermon, of a chapter in Acts, and if we're not careful, we might say to ourselves or to the person beside us, we're gonna have to try a lot harder. We're gonna have to work a lot harder at this. But it seems clear to me, and I think Paul expresses this too, that if we would just simply open our hands and our hearts and our minds to the love and the will of Christ Jesus, let his spirit come into you His spirit will wash away the darkest parts of us. His grace will cover the sin that is in us, that easily befalls us. More of him, less of us. And all of that stuff I talked about on the front end will take care of itself. More of him, less of us. That's what I want to pray for. God, sometimes your word um, is so hard, so hard to hear, and today, even harder to teach. So God, I pray that if there were any words that I spoke that weren't from you, that those words would quickly fall from the, the ears and the memory of the folks who've gathered here this morning. But for any words that were coming from you and from your written word, If those words came and they were just difficult to hear, but they were true, God, I pray that they would be planted deeply in the soil of our hearts. Sort of like those trees planted by the the water that Pastor Cade prayed for earlier. God, I pray that, that we would be light in dark places. That we ourselves would be the ones who carry your goodness and your mercy and your love into a world that's craving for it. A world starving to death. God, we say in our benediction that wherever we go and whomever we meet, we're gonna be kind and we're gonna be gentle and we're gonna be thoughtful and we're gonna be gracious all because we do not know the burdens that others bear. The burdens in their hearts, the burdens in their minds, the burdens in their bodies. And all of that could sound like just some really sweet sentiment until we finish with the words, for we are the body of Christ. You have made your home in us. You're counting on us. So fill us more with your spirit. Fill us more with who you are so that when others experience us, when others speak to us, when others hear from us, when others watch the way we live, they would see a righteousness that's not from ourselves, but a righteousness that's been given as a gift from God. More of you, less of us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.